Right, right. We okay. should be recording again. We've had our tea and we're ready to start the second part of our talk. So just a quick recap on what went before. And we were talking mainly about queen pheromone. Queen pheromones produce a complex mix of different the queen produces a complex mix of different chemicals which in different combinations and different strengths can cause a range of responses in bees and it depends on the bee it depends on the bee whether she'll hear the chemical message or not mm -hmm. clicking it's not moving on so as the queen ages if a queen um, is well mated um, and with a lot of different drones and she was well nourished as a larvae she'll probably go on and produce pheromones for a good long time and we've got a queen that's about four years old that's still going like the clappers um, but at, usually as they age the pheromones begin to fade and eventually when the pheromones dip below a certain threshold the bees will begin to think about replacing her and they'll either do that by um, supersedure or maybe even an old queen will have enough um, forces in the colony to one last form um, but basically the range and the, the quality of the pheromones that she um, secretes has an awful lot to do with um, how well she got rogered basically if you know what that is in Australia do you say it different in Australia <laughs> I don't know I, I'm sure they'll work it out <laughs> but we've talked about the pheromones from the Queen um, nearly everything in the colony every inhabitant of the colony even um, even larvae in their cells will give off pheromones which which kind of feed into the, the, the mechanisms which um, control colony life. So an interesting one is queen cells will give off pheromones which will top up the queen substance. So um, we all know if a, if a queen is getting old and she's fading, they'll make a supersedure cell or a range of maybe up to six supersedure cells. But sometimes when those supersedure cells reach pupil level, when, the, when there's a pupa in it, um, that will also secrete pheromones which top up the level of queen substance so then the bees think they don't need a new queen anymore because they've got sufficient pheromone and so they tear them down again and then they haven't got enough queen pheromone so they make another one and you can get that go on all season i don't know if anyone's ever experienced that it's the mystery of the disappearing queen cell or supersedure cell they they make them they tear them down they make them they tear them down and if you recognize that that's happening then probably as a beekeeper you need to intervene because it's um it can all go terribly wrong so um when you say intervene take the queen out then i guess to, to force the issue requeen them or take her out so that they have to make emergencies mm -hmm. but by that point if she's if the colony is at that level i would i would think about requeening or uniting her to another colony and with, with the with the pheromone being given out by the queen cell, uh, that the bees do pick this up and and they will antennally pass it round the, um, the the hive again. Uh, and when we're picking queen cells to keep uh, here at the abbey, what we tend to do is pick the ones that the bees are showing the most interest in. So if there's there's a lot of bees on it, uh, vibrating it and touching it. Um, we, we think, well, they really like that one. That, that's one of the guides we use to, to which cell it's, to keep. It's a better guide than appearance. Sometimes you can see a lovely queen cell and it can be a dud. You know, it could either have a dead larvae in or it could be empty even. And when a virgin's first born from um, a queen cell, she doesn't automatically have the full complement of pheromones that a mated queen would have. In fact, for the first couple of days, she's probably chemically quite invisible to the bees. They don't pay much attention to her. She has to feed herself and, and get strong. And it's only on about day three where she starts to emit um, to emit the 9 ODA and, and the bees will start taking notice of her. She'll start soliciting for food and she'll become more queenly. And again, it's not till after she's mated that she's exuding the full complement of queen pheromones. So vir that's why if you, if you open a colony and there's a virgin just coming out, if you pull a virgin, as we call it over here, you can probably put her into another colony and they would accept her, a queen's colony, because she won't, she'll just be like a bee. Mm -hmm. 
now we're going on to the more really interesting bit and Martin has researched this extent, uh, extensively. It's not that he doesn't get out very much, it's just... <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it away, Martin. Okay, so um, the mating process uh, in bees is, in honeybees, is virtually unique in, in the animal kingdom. And it, it, it's actually a whole talk on its own. But the, the, the key thing here is that um, the mating process takes place outside on the wing away from the hive and uh, usually a few kilometers away. And it, it's all to do with attraction and pheromones. So the, the virgin queens and the drones both use mandibular pheromone but they use them in different ways. So Claire was talking uh, in the previous slide about the Virgin Queen and the production of her mandibular pheromone. And that, that level of production reaches the peak in the afternoons when she's about to go out on her mating flight. And she uses this pheromone to attract drones uh, because she wants to mate with as many unrelated drones from different hives as she can. So what she'll tend to do is she will tend to fly downwind and let this uh, pheromone waft ahead of her through the air. The drones uh, who will fly upwind towards her, they are specifically designed to uh, be receptive to 9ODA, the queen mandibular pheromone. And their, their um, antennae are, are finely tuned to this. So uh, what happens is that the drones will orientate towards this uh, queen pheromone, but they also give out a pheromone of their own. They, they give out mandibular pheromone, but the mandibular pheromone that they give out doesn't attract virgin queens. It actually attracts other drones. And, and so what happens is they, they, start, they use their pheromone to form aggregations, which will then develop into drone congregation areas. And it's these congregation areas that the virgin queens fly into. May in I just interject? Make... You can indeed. So the queen is flying downwind from a colony and the drone is flying upwind. Does that mean they go to different places? Yeah, absolutely. That, that's part of the key strategy that they will meet um, recipients from, from other hives. Uh, other, so otherwise, they'll, they'll be mating with their brothers, as it were, so which we don't want. Councils, no, no. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So, so when the Virgin Queen finds this drone congregation area, uh, she, she will fly into it and uh, the 9 ODA that she's giving off from her mandibular for, uh, glands, that will attract drones in from about 60 meters away. She'll also open her sting chamber and she'll release uh, pheromone from her Kozhevnikov gland. And that has, uh, again, uh, an effect of attracting drones in from a closer distance. She also uh, uses pheromone from her turgic glands. And that has the effect of encouraging the drones to uh, catch up with her from about a, 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 a half a meter away and then to actually physically mount her and uh, mate with her. And it's nothing to do with uh, the physical prowess of, of the drone or what he looks like or even what he smells like because he is, uh, of course, uh, catching up with her from behind. So she's got no real knowledge of what he's going to look like. But, not uh, even a quick backward glance. Not even a backward glance. It's, <laughs> all to, it's all to do with pheromone. And if it wasn't for the, uh, the, the pheromone um, attraction that, that exists between the two uh, sexes, it, it would never take place. And uh, that, that's why it's so important to this part of uh, honeybee life. It's interesting that you said uh, mentioned the Kozhevnikov gland because that's an attract in, in lots of different contexts. So it attracts young workers around to the queen to look after her. It, it attracts, in the worker bee, it attracts other bees to come and sting in the same place. And mm -hmm. in this case, it's you being an attractant to drones. So it's three different contexts that the same gland is being used. Yeah, m m m many uh, pheromones are multifunctional, especially pheromones exhibited by the queen. And it would depend uh, on, on the age and type of bee that, that is going to react to it. So as we said, everything in the hive emits pheromones and brood is no exception. So open brood, 
older open, in, um, open brood will inhibit ovary development in conjunction with queen pheromone. So if you've got um, a colony that has waiting for a virgin to mate or has lost their queen, you won't get laying workers kick in as long as you've got some brood. The brood will suppress laying workers' ovaries developing. And that's a useful thing to know. So if you're, but you know, the, the virgin's got a window of five weeks or so to mate. And if you're on like four and a half weeks and you're thinking, has she mated or not? Um, you could stick some open brood in there, which would form, perform two functions. Number one, if they haven't got a queen, they would use young larvae to make queen cells or the open brood would also stop laying workers kick in and we all know when you get laying workers it's kind of game over mm -hmm. and so what you refer to as a test comb yes a test comb mm -hmm. there are other effects of brood pheromone so as a releaser the releaser effects are um the brood itself will give out signals to the nurse bees telling it what kind of food it needs so <clears throat> larvae isn't fed a universal food. When it's a young larvae, it will get a different formula to when it's an older larvae. Drone larvae will get fed a different formula than worker brood. And as we know, um, queen um, larvae will get fed royal jelly all its life. So um, it's very important that this food is finely tuned depending on what the larvae is going to develop into. Um, when the cell's ready to be capped over on the fifth day, we know that the, the larvae will then give a pheromone to say, I'm ready now, cap me over. Unfortunately, in this country, you don't have the, the pleasure of varroa yet. The varroa mite can recognize this pheromonal signal at day five and slip into the cell just before it's capped over. And in this case, the pheromone is called a caramone because it's signaling to um, um, an animal, a different species. Also, brood pheromone will stimulate pollen collection because obviously pollen is a big component of, of larval food. So that, that's a bit of an obvious one. Um, as we've discussed earlier, um, it can inhibit worker ovary development. It stimulates the hyperpharyngeal gland. So that's a physical, physiological effect on the bees. It increases royal jelly production. Again, that's a physiological effect. And it can delay foraging and inhibit juvenile hormone. And so basically, um, if there's lots of larvae that need feeding, the nurse bees will be stopped from becoming, from going through their, their, their sequence of jobs to become foragers because they're needed for brood rearing. I'm going to let Martin take the next one because this is quite an interesting one. Okay, so what, what we've got here is um, a, a test to see how hygienic uh, bees can be in their behaviour. And what's happened is this area of brood that you see in front of you has been killed uh, either by freezing with liquid nitrogen or uh, by um, pinpricking in order to kill the larvae beneath. But what they're trying to do is to find out um, how the bees respond to uh, th this dead uh, larvae. Uh, and so what happens is wh when it dies, the larvae give off a pheromone. There's still pheromones even after death. And they use two pheromones, uh, beta-osamine and oleic acid and they work um, synergistically with each other. One encourages the bees to come and examine the cell and to uncap it. And the other one encourages the bees to actually remove the dead larvae or dead pupa that they find underneath it. So, so neither will work without the other. And the interesting thing is that all bees seem to show levels of hygienic behavior, but it's the threshold at which they start to actually carry out this behavior. So some bees are much, uh, much more receptive to the pheromone and will come and start cleaning out larvae uh, very readily. Others uh, need much higher levels in order to uh, stimulate the behavior to take place. Uh, and, and this is one of the things we've been looking at, uh, certainly in, in our country, because it has uh, repercussions for whether they can detect and remove uh, pupa uh, or larvae that have been infected with varroa so it, it's it's certainly one of the things that the western world is look, looking at um, yeah for... i'm very skeptical because um i think if we cherry pick 
characteristics or behaviors even if they're good behaviors for bees you're going to um possibly lose other important behaviors you know we're, we're not clever enough we can genetically modify them a little bit but we're not clever enough to make it sustainable or balance it out properly and um, Marla Spivak who did the work in America the Minnesotan um, hygienic bee did find that um, in in her journey to get hygienic bees there was an inbreeding part where actually they were clear they, they were clearing out healthy larvae as well so things can go awry very quickly if we mess around genetically with bees um, I think it, it can become unbalanced very quickly anyway that's just me this is two heptanone this is a fast this is a release of pheromone yeah this, this is the one that's released by the uh, worker bees uh, on guard duty at the front and it's released from their mandibular glands it, this is the exact opposite of the uh, low volatility uh, queen pheromone this is highly volatile and, and it will waft around in front of the hive and, and it will encourage other guard bees to come and uh, join in the defense of the colony should they come under attack from either other bees or wasps as we call them in this country hornets whatever yeah this one we've already discussed a little bit this is isopentyl acetate so if a bee stings you she'll leave a little bit of this chemical there which will attract other bees to come and there sting you it's a, a volatile chemical it will evaporate off quite quickly and if you do get stung if you wash or, or blow a bit of smoke at it you can mask the smoke and that's why we normally use lead gloves and absolutely are very nice and um they would get you'd get some glove and that pheromone seemed to stay in the leather of the glove for longer than necessary and so eventually the, the glove will be covered in stings and so anytime you put your gloves anywhere near the hives you are wafting this isopentyl acetate and bees were just fed up before you even started so we took those away um, we now use light nitro gloves which can wash or sometimes bare hands even. We found out it's, it's easier to work gently with the bees mm -hmm. and we get stung less. This is another interesting one. This is a primer pheromone. It, um, it's ethyl oleate. I'm going to let Martin take this one. Okay, so um, um, ethyl oleate, what, what actually happens is that the forager bees that are returning it need to be, uh, with, with nectar, uh, they, they need to be unloaded by the house bees. And if they're not unloaded quickly enough, then that starts to um, induce a behaviour in them that they're not going to go back out. Why, wouldn't, why wouldn't they unload it quickly? Uh, if they've already got sufficient food in the... Well, there's nowhere to put it. Or, yeah, they've got sufficient yeah. or that they can't stash it anywhere. And so the, these foragers don't end up carrying this nectar and it wouldn't be necessary. And, and so what seems to happen is they're is a, a very sort of micro level of fermentation uh, and and this this chemical is created uh, in the body of the bee and this then when it gets passed across to the house bee this actually um, suppresses the behavior to go out and forage again or, or, or to encourage other foragers to go out and actually work so, so it regulates if, if there's yeah. not no it stops the nurse bees from becoming foragers because they're not really needed to be foragers. that's right yeah yeah it, it, if, if there's nothing uh, if, if there's um no no more foraging that can be done then then it will prevent that behavior from from working through so it's a it's a beautiful feedback system yeah this is the one that most beekeepers are familiar with. This is not a so bees on their entrance or around the evidence. Yeah, now they're familiar with the ones that are This is from the bees. It's a piece of pheromone. They're tracking. 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 But also you find things like um, my sister was cleaning her bathroom with a, um, a citrusy cleaning spray and um, her bathroom filled up with honeybees. And I think what happened was there must have been a swarm passing by and, and she had a bathroom window open and she was using the citrusy smell and they, some of them got confused and just peeled off into her bath. It's also used um, during swarming to um, get the swarm to settle, and usually on its initial thing, or even when the scout bees are found in new home and they'll nuzz enough mm. bees in. So it's an attractant and it's used quite a lot. Mm -hmm. I've heard they also use it to send up um, flowers, floral oh, sources. So, so when, when they uh, actually take nectar from a flower, what they do is they will scent mark it with a bit of nasinov. And that seems to be a cue to other bees not to bother to try and visit that flower 
uh, because they, they've already um, sucked it dry, as it were. The, the nasnoff doesn't last too long, and that usually should be sufficient time for the flower to um, refill its nectaries and, and then be more appealing to a bee. So yeah, you, it's you a short-term thing. Yeah, you see bees hover around a flower, and then they, they kind of sniff, and then they, well, sniff. <laughs> they, they decide not to visit it and go to the one next door. So that's neat, isn't it? Mm. Interestingly, um, solitary bees, semi-social bees, they, they do a similar sort of thing, but they use um, mandibular pheromone uh, rather than nasnoff. Mm -hmm. And, and so uh, all, all, all these bees have the same sort of glands and use the same sort of chemicals, but they use them in different ways. Yeah. Even empty comb doesn't produce pheromones, but it will retain pheromones because wax is absorbent. It's an organic substance. It will absorb uh, chemicals, um, substances, and smells. Um, it will retain those cells. So empty comb actually um, stimulates the hoarding instinct in bees. So bees have got a hoarding instinct, and if they've got empty comb, they will feel compelled to fill it up. And we all know... Um, there are such things as swarm lures, aren't they, which is based on Nasnoff pheromone, but to be honest, I've never found them work. But if you put a bait, a bait um, hive, I usually put it on my shed roof, and you put some empty comb in, particularly comb that have brood in, you'll get a swarm easy peasy. Yeah, I, I always refer to it as old dark cheesy comb. Yeah, it's much more efficient than I think. I mean, the, the synthetic um, swarm lures, I've never really known one to work. But this, and some people I've read in old books that they used to rub lemon balm around the inside of the hive, but a bit of cheesy old, that works every time. So we're going to summarise now. Um, the communication achieved by pheromones depends entirely on context. So um, it depends on the age of the bee, her physiological condition, um, her age, her individual character, even her genetic inheritance and nutritional state. All of these things will affect if the chemical being admitted is going to elicit any kind of behaviour or not. So, for example, old foragers are not attracted to the queen. In fact, they're almost repelled by her. And this is, um, this is why the, the queen tries to keep young bees around her, because they're going to do her less harm. Old bees will actually attack a queen, even their own queen sometimes. We, we did have an incident. Um, last year, we were asked to go and look at some bees for one of our friends when, when he was away on holiday. And we had to drive a, a fair way to get to it. And when we got there, it was a bit dull and a bit drizzly, and not really bee weather. All the bees were at home. It was very yeah, crowded. All those old foragers were in the hive. And when we, when we opened the hive, we found the queen. And, and they were really, I mean, they, they were harassing her. They, they, they were, she was nervous. I think what happened was the queen was nervous, and she overproduced very Hormones, and, and the older bees were just going for her and Martin had the presence of mind to puff a bit of smoke at her and they dispersed but I think if we hadn't done anything they would have bought her yeah and, and you do get that um we mark uh, queens or queens I must admit we don't click queens here but I, I know it's still very popular we don't really mark queens mid-season do we no again because the balance of the bees isn't right in there but I, I, I remember uh, in my early job a master beekeeper uh, to, uh, to um, mark a queen and, and, and he did it very professionally and very well put her back in the hive and all the bees just jumped on her pounced on her and, and bored her and killed her and um, he, he was distraught and we all laughed to be honest but horrible <laughs> I would have cried um, the strength of the signal um, particularly volatile signals may depend on the conditions inside and outside hive so how crowded the hive is maybe even the atmospheric pressure um, the ventilation in the hive other conflicting scents which may interfere or confuse signals so in this country for varroa control there is a treatment which is based on thymes which is, um, a very strong selling smelling treatment it stinks and the bees don't like it very much and in the past when i've used thyme or varroa control you find that the colony is just not functioning as normal they don't feed i think it interferes with supersedure um, they, the, the guarding behaviour at the entrance is not very coordinated, so I'm really wary of putting strong cells in or around the hive. Yeah, we, we tend to use that thymol treatment, still the most popular treatment in the, uh, in the country, mm. uh, but, but it actually um, is used normally around about the end of July, early August, right when you might be having a uh, supersedure yeah. going on, or indeed when you want those bees yeah. to be guarding um, for robbing. So also, conditions outside the hive could um, affect the bees, especially things with mating and orientation, um, alarm pheromones or food gathering maybe affected by environmental circumstances or other conflicting smells outside if you've ever cut grass around a beehive the bees don't like it very much do they they come and attack you um, apparently cut grass gives off green leaf volatiles which has got similar components as alarm pheromones ice pentalastic like an acetated smell which the grass gives off um, to help protect itself so it will attract insects then to come and, and, and attack you stop you attacking the grass it's a sort of i think that's called an alimone and we're getting towards the end now, I can see the time's ticking on. So beekeeping applications, obviously queen rearing is an obvious one. Um, you know, if you take a queen out of the colony, they will start making queen cells. Or if you separate the queen from brood rearing area, they will again make queen cells through the super seed genes. So we've learned how to do that to help us make new queens or to encourage bees to make queens. 
we've mentioned a test comb, which you can use to check for queenlessness. And it's different workers. Um, if you're using um, a queen in a cage to a colony, you, you can put smells in, which would um, confuse the bees so that they're less likely to attack her. So yeah, you, you, you can mask it with, yeah. uh, smoke, with, with heavy smoking, or even perhaps I've seen it done with, with air freshener. Uh, yeah. that, that will work. Normally, when, you, when you're putting two colonies together, we can um, slow down the, the time that it takes for the yeah. bees to get together. And that allows the, the, the pheromones and the, the colony odour to some, somewhat mingle together. Mm -hmm. And you do that just by uniting over some newspaper. Um, and swarm attraction, which you can use a bait hive or, um, like I said, I think old comb is more effective than the swarm lure. So pheromone communication is a finely tuned and complex dialogue, dialogue between all members of the honeybee colony. It's got many layers of possibly, Bob's start again. It's got many layers of possibility and there are feedback loops which ensure that the resulting behaviour of bees is flexible and that is key. The honeybee colony needs to be plastic and flexible and opportunistic with so many backup systems so that they can survive and, and the superorganism has got all this complex behaviour in order to get their genes into the next generation. It's, it's all about survival and there are so many plan B, plan C, plan D. Can go wrong but and very often as beekeepers we, we kind of don't respect that so I think we, we need to be more aware um, that the bees are communicating all the time and we shouldn't go in with our big thick beekeeping gloves and expect them to comply. Yeah, we, we're using our senses, we're using our sight and our touch, but we're not very good at using our sense of smell to, to detect pheromones, what's going on in the hive. So if you've got any further questions, you can email us directly, um, cdensley at buckfast.org.uk or mhan at and we will do our best to um, respond to any queries that you might have. Um, it's taken us two days to do these two half-hour <laughs> things. We've been so rubbish, um, so many blips and, and takeouts, and, and, um, but finally I think we've got here. <laughs> Well, I hope you enjoyed it anyway. We certainly had a lot of fun putting it together. And uh, as I say, I, I hope it reaches you okay with the uh, technology available. And um, yeah, thanks very much for asking us to do it. And uh, if you want another talk in the future, then get Kevin to have a chat with us. Bye-bye, Kevin. Yeah, bye.